Welcome to the worship for the third Sunday in Advent, the 13th of December. We begin today with hymn number 306, O Come All Ye Faithful, and we will finish with number 296, While Humble Shepherds Watch Their Flocks. Enjoy your worship with us this morning. Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, I'll just 
go over the information I gave you last week, two services on Christmas Eve, half past five on Zoom, where we'll make a first angle if you want to, and then there will be an online service that replaces the watch night service. It'll be available from the morning of Christmas Eve, so you don't need to stay up to midnight to watch it unless you want to. So, I know people like to come to church on Christmas Eve, but it's really not practical with the kind of numbers we'd expect this year, so this is our alternative. There will also be a service at half past 10 on Christmas Day, and I'm thinking particularly of those who might be feeling a little bit quiet on Christmas Day because the normal family isn't around, maybe on your own or just a couple when there'd normally be more family. If you normally have a decent book you in every week for worship, that won't work on Christmas Day. So if you want to come on Christmas Day, you need to book that in yourself. Uh, all the sun other Sundays, that's fine, but on Christmas Day, if you want to come, you need to book it yourself, not uh, rely on the regular weekly bookings. And bookings are now open for Christmas Day. And, and just a wee reminder, as I said last week, please don't hang your Christmas cards out in church. We can't see a way to do it safely, so we're just basically saying, I'm really sorry, but we're not gonna, we're gonna ask you not to do that. So as we prepare to worship this morning, I invite you to take a moment to still yourself, to breathe deeply and focus on God, to breathe out and empty yourself of fear, of hate, of anxiety. Breathe in and fill yourself with love, with life, and with mercy. Breathe out and empty yourself of busyness, of selfishness, of greed. Breathe in peace and joy and hope. And breathe out idolatry, self-worship, false gods. Breathe in and fill yourself with God, with Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. We gather in love, in hope, as we are, to praise God and bear witness to the light shining through the darkness. We come in worship and praise to be refreshed and renewed and offer our lives once again to God. May the knowledge of God's love and grace fill our hearts with joy this Advent season. Let us come as one people, one body, united in Christ. Let us come together and worship. Today we will light the third candle of the Advent wreath, the candle of joy. See who's lighting those for us this morning. Lucy, Patrick, Jessica and Hannah light the candles for us in their homes and now we light the third, first three candles on our Advent wreath. In our homes and in our churches, all over a hurting world, the light of Christ comes this Advent. On this day we remember the Spirit who brings joy into our lives. Let us pray. God of joy, we rejoice in the reality of who you are. We live within the joy of your love for us. Our contentment comes and goes, 
Our happiness ebbs and flows. Our feelings depend on our circumstances, our physical health, our brain chemistry. But our joy is deeply rooted in our identity as your beloved children. And for this, we give you thanks. God, you broke down the barriers when you came down beside us. In Jesus, in Jesus your hands comforted us. So here in the company of the neighbour we know, or maybe the stranger in our midst, and the self from whom we turn, we ask to love as Jesus loved. Make us the place and time, Lord, when heaven and earth become one, and we in word and flesh know ourselves loved. God of patience, we have so much to learn from you. The waiting, the longing, the hoping, the praying, and the doing that your will may be done. When we behave in ways we shouldn't, call us back to your way of loving, of serving, of caring, that we might be renewed, purified, refined by your Spirit, so that your love can brighten our world, put joy into our daily living, and enable us to do your will. God of patience, teach us to see through your eyes, to hear through your ears, to feel with your heart, and speak with your wisdom. This we pray in Jesus' name, and in his name I invite you to join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first piece of music for meditation this morning is Eric Smith playing Away in a Man.
bonus there too. Our first reading today is by Christine Patterson. This reading is from Luke, chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. Mary's Song of Praise. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has looked with favour on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Amen. Thanks be to God. Mary's Magnificat is Mary's Magnificat is something that is very well known, very familiar, but it's also in language that is very biblical, and we can sort of start to take it for granted. I saw this modern rephrasing of Mary's song, the Magnificat, the other day, and I thought it helps you to think about it slightly more different, slightly differently. I am so so happy. Every bit of me from my head to my toes is tingling because I know God is smiling on me. I might not be much, but he knows about me and has actually chosen me. From now on, when people think of me, they will feel good too because they also will see the amazing things that God has done for me. God is holy. From the beginning of time, he has been kind to everyone who recognizes that he is the one true God. He has used his strength to foil the plans of those who would make themselves great. Because of him, even kings have lost their homes. But at the same time, he builds up and encourages those on whom the world looks down. He feeds the hungry, but turns away those who have eaten more than their fill. In the past, God made promises to our people, and I know he has kept them. Now he is showing how much he cares for his people. He is coming to help them, because he loves them now, and will love them forever. Mary's elegant, exuberant prayer, the Magnificat, is like an overture to Luke's Gospel in which all the important themes that he brings up appear again and again. The emphasis in Luke's Gospel is on women and the marginalised and the Holy Spirit is evident. And Mary, filled with the Holy Spirit, gives voice to those who are lonely, like the shepherds to whom the angels later announce the birth of Jesus. Her spontaneous offering in song echoes Hannah's praise many years earlier for God's marvellous deeds in the lives of all that are marginalised or downtrodden. Like Hannah, Mary sings out of her own experience, her own hope, but out of the experience and hope of her people as well. It is a lovely expression of joy at God's promises kept, a celebration of tables being turned or overturned, the lowly lifted up, the proud brought down, the hungry fed. God remembers the people of Israel and the promises God has made to them. A powerful text for hearts hungry for good news. In fact, Mary, the young pregnant teenager, has become quite an articulate radical, an astonished prophet singing about a world in which the last have become first and the first last. It reassures us about God's steadfast love, justice, and faithfulness in every age, no matter what. 
Sometimes those promises do seem too good to be true. Yet we learn together to trust in them and live each day in their light. The Magnificat was considered so radical that the government of Guatemala banned the singing of it 30 years ago. Because unlike Away in a Manger, this prayer was apparently considered subversive, politically dangerous, and might incite people to riot. Not usually the image we traditionally associate with Mary, is it? As for ourselves, as we journey through this Advent, we're invited to challenge the expectations of our lives. Our expectations of God, of success, of how we are to love, how to live in the season of Advent and beyond, in ways that we've never had to address before. Plans we made for the future, for our lives, or even just for this Christmas season, have changed for everyone this year. But at any given time, someone's plans are being derailed by a death of someone close to them, recent or remembered, a worrying diagnosis or symptom, changes in family, employment or relationships. And somehow that's all the harder at this time of year when the manufactured cheeriness of the season seems to sort of belittle our challenges or make us feel inadequate because of our struggles. Which is why this passage may be just the thing we need in the middle of Advent. The day marked with a candle of joy. Because it introduces a little reality into our progress towards Bethlehem. Which is simply that even while we anticipate the birth of the Christ child, give thanks for that gift, and believe that his death and resurrection promises new and eternal life, Yet still things can be quite difficult in the meantime. There is a vision for the future, but we live in the present, counting on the promises of God and working towards them. Mary had the nerve and imagination to claim such a future for herself and her people. But Barbara Brown Taylor says that she was singing about it ahead of time not in the future tense, but in the past, as if the promise had already come true. She says prophets almost never get their verb tenses straight because part of their gift is being able to see the world as God sees it, as an eternally unfolding mystery that surprises everyone. Well, we live in the midst of that mystery. Are we capable of mixing our tenses too? seeing in the past what is unfolding in our lives and what is still to come, bringing our deep concerns and prayers, but then also going out to work and struggle and care, offering through our words and deeds the healing and peace that comes from the God we know in Jesus, bringing our praise with Mary and whatever we are feeling and experiencing knowing that Emmanuel, God, is with us in all of it. In God's name, Amen. Our next piece of music for meditation will be played for us by Joy, and it is Es ist in Rose in Sprung by Brahms.
Our sacred reading today will be read for us by Sanders Patterson. This reading is from Luke chapter 1, verses 57 to 66, the birth of John the Baptist. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbours and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, None of your relatives has this name. Then they began motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue free, and he began to speak, praising God. Fear came over all the neighbours, and all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them pondered them and said, What then will this child become? For indeed the hand of the Lord was with him. Thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word. Amen. As the parents of John the Baptist, Elizabeth and Zechariah have an important place in the Christmas story. We know they are older and childless, but the child they are to have will become a, know, a name known for centuries. Who can blame Zechariah for not believing the angel? But the result of his unbelief is to be silent, unable to speak until the child is born. Well, I only did a silent retreat for three days, and much to everyone's surprise, including mine, I actually enjoyed it. He wasn't able to speak for nine months, as I said last week, and he struck speechless. Perhaps God expected Zechariah to immediately believe, to sign up, but he must be used to people not saying yes immediately. Because how many of you have had a sort of, God thinks I should do this? Now nah, we'll just wait and see. I'm not so sure if I will. I certainly know Mark, my calling, had that experience. But I wonder what goes through his mind in those months of silence. It says that he asked for a tablet and he wrote his name is John. So presumably he wrote some other things down during those nine months. He wouldn't have been completely unable to communicate. And he obviously saw signs that there was a baby on the way as the angel had said they would be. So there must have been a point during that time when he started to believe the angel. There are signs that a baby is coming. He must have seen that God was at work. So today we're at the candle of joy, and there are probably few things in life that bring more of a message of joy to the world than the new life, a birth of a baby. What potential there is in that little person, whether it's Jesus, John the Baptist, or any other child who is expected, they are signs of God in this world. And before they even utter a word, they can bring hope and joy and immense love. So we watch with anticipation to see what their life will be like, what they will be like, if they will fulfill all their potential because each of their lives will be different, unique, and that's as it should be. This year, Advent and Christmas will not be the usual experiences that we've got used to over the last few years or decades. There is a space between people which can lead to isolation and loneliness, but which also means safety. The pandemic has made us rethink so many things about ourselves and how we respond. We have to rethink what we can do to proclaim God among us. We've had to let go of a lot of things, reframe the language and even the story for a different context, and ask ourselves how might we be witnesses to the Incarnation in such a time. 
When the future is more uncertain than usual, we wait. And we long for the gift of permission or denial, setting the boundaries, anticipating news in hope or in dread. Our plans cannot be set until we know the limits that they will occupy. So we watch the space, still formless and void, waiting for definition enough that we may fill it with whatever good ideas will fit within it. Most of us find uncertainty difficult, and the pandemic has brought with it a huge amount of uncertainty. For those whose lives have always felt secure up until now, it's vastly increased the level of uncertainty and anxiety, and for those who've always had to live precariously, it's led to huge anxiety. It's also brought new and different givens, limitations and rules around which we've had to learn to live and work. There is a space between us. We need to mind the gap, as they tell us on the trains. We need to be aware of these spaces, but we also need to bridge the gap. Where there once was an embrace, there is now a gap even between ourselves and our outstretched fingertips. And yet all the unspent love is poured into the void, preserving distance and preserving life. So we watch this space, this two meters that separates us, and yet also binds us in our care for one another. Because one of the hardest things about the pandemic has been the distance which has, has made us keep from loved ones. That distance is absolutely an expression of love, but it's not one we would ever have wanted or chosen. And we have learned new ways and rediscovered old ways of connecting with one another when we can't do so in person. And we will be very aware of the people who we would usually see in church every Sunday, but who we can't see at the moment, and crucially those who are most at risk of being missing during this time. Who have become more invisible, have less access to the community and to support than before. And the other side of the coin is who do we see now online that we weren't seeing before? And how will we preserve those relationships when everything does turn back to something like normal? In everything that is anxious and traumatic and heartbreaking, in everything that is busy and rushed and burdensome, in everything that never seems to stop or slow, we dig out with our bare hands a well from which to drink. So we watch the space and give thanks for the blessing of a moment of being, not doing. Where the COVID-19 has left us with more to do than ever, or with a sudden loss of work or structure, it can be hard to create those intentional spaces in which we focus on being replenished and renewed. Space for God, space for prayer, just space that refills what is empty. Being busy can stop us doing it, but having no structure and more time can also stop us doing it. There are many excellent practices in the Christian tradition that will help us with this. Some of you might be familiar with mindfulness, taking a few minutes a day to focus on what's in front of you, paying attention to the colours and shapes, and other things, and not to the other things that might be on your mind. Some of you may have noticed there is an excellent mindfulness meditation on how to eat a piece of chocolate in the Advent calendar. Strongly recommend it. I didn't write it. Lighting a candle, watching the flame for just a few minutes each night before you go to bed, focusing on the light and the warmth and giving thanks for what you can give thanks for but don't forget to blow it out before you go to sleep. Find time each day to write down one word that connects you with God, with hope, with peace, with love, or with joy. 
Spend a moment with that word. And if, like me, your mind wanders when you just sit and look at something, try doodling, scribbling around it, drawing patterns, drawing pictures. I found that really helpful recently in stilling my mind. There is a potential in every one of us that is untapped. Not just in a new baby, but also in the Elizabeths and Zacharias of the world who thought their opportunities had passed. Our challenge as God's people is to be fully conscious of the reality of Christ's first coming and the surety of his return. We are a people of Advent, a people of hope, love, joy and peace. We are ordinary people, making the most of what we can do to participate in the gospel of Jesus Christ. People may talk about the need to put Christ back into Christmas, but Christ never left Christmas. Christ is in Christmas, in Advent, in church and in our lives. So watch this space within us, between us, around us. Stay alert in the uncertainty, in keeping distance, in remembering the missing, in doing, in being, in worship, and in the world. Watch this space, for God is in this space. In God's name. Our third meditation is a prelude, Still Enough, by Jan Swart. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the promise of this season. For the hope you born each year as we celebrate your son's birth. The hope and joy that each new life brings to humanity. We thank you for this time to reflect and to wonder. Full of wonder, we look to you, the wonderful, the one who renews and restores and refreshes our tired faith. Sometimes we need reassurance and definite answers and clear guidelines. But we know that usually Jesus answers our questions with more questions and meets our hesitations with challenge. 
prayed, God, forgive us for undue concern about finding answers, overlooking the signs of your presence here and now. Be our companion in our search for meaning, guiding our thoughts and opening up our minds. Make us ready to receive you afresh in this Advent season. In the tradition of Mary and all who have said yes to you, we add our assent to theirs. Although we sometimes feel overwhelmed and wonder if we are worthy or capable of following your calling, we have questions, but we will not be afraid to ask them. We will hear and ponder the assurance that you will empower us, and we will strive to say like Mary, let it be with us according to your will. But even as we offer ourselves, we know there are so many who are struggling. And so as we travel ever closer to Christmas, we bring before you those who may be finding the journey hard. Those seriously ill, lacking energy and strength for the season, the bereaved mourning while others are celebrating. People facing loss of other kinds, perhaps unemployment. Families torn apart by disagreement, discord or divorce. Who dread being together yet face loneliness apart. And families who will have to choose this year who to see and not see this Christmas. Families and friends cautious about meeting, protecting themselves and others bringer of hope and giver of comfort, renew strength, restore relationships, and refresh faith, we pray. In a world aching from division, disease, intolerance, poverty, and war, we await your coming again to bring peace and unity, to nourish our bodies and our spirits, to heal this world, and to gather us in love. Help, uh, help show us that the greatest gift of all is your presence at the centre of our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. As usual, I'll ask you to remain seated for the benediction and watch for your turn to leave you at the end. May our souls magnify the Lord. May we go from our time of worship with our spirits rejoicing in God our Saviour, emboldened and challenged to serve the Lord. And as we wait to celebrate God newly born and in the flesh, Jesus Christ, light of the world, may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with each one of you and those whom you love, near and far away, now and always. Amen.